Okay, hi everyone. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about respiratory failure and I've divided the talk into two sections. The first section is looking at gas exchange, while the second section will look a little bit more closely at the different types of respiratory failure. Apologize for my voice. I am a bit under the weather, but I thought I should get this done. Okie dokes. So as usual, let's look at a case. So this is a 56 year old man with renal failure who presents with increasing shortness of breath for two days. When you examine him, he's drowsy, looks exhausted. SpO2 on room A is 85%. Pulse 134 beats per minute. Blood pressure is 146.65. This is his blood gas. So what I would like you to do is pause the video, look at the blood gas, and then work out what are the abnormalities, and see if you can come up with some ideas to explain the abnormalities, particularly in relation to respiratory failure. All right, so by the end of this lecture, we will try to achieve the following objectives. I'm not going to talk through them. You can pause the video and have a look at the list so you make sure that you cover these things um, as the talk progresses. What is respiratory failure? Again, just stop the video and see if you can answer this yourself. So here is a definition of respiratory failure. It's a condition characterized by failure of gas exchange involving one or both of the main gases of respiration, that is oxygen and carbon dioxide. And classically, it's defined as a PO2 of less than 60 millimeters mercury and or a PCO2 of more than 50 millimeters mercury. Usually, when we're talking about respiratory failure with a high carbon dioxide, it is often associated with a low PO2 as well. To understand respiratory failure, we need to understand how those two main gases act in the body and how they are transferred, exchanged and transported. So let's think about oxygen and CO2, how they are different and how that affects their exchange. You might want to pause the video, see if you could tell me whatever you know about these two gases. If you listened to my previous talks on pulmonary ventilation and perfusion, you'll have an idea about this. Okay, so if we look at oxygen, its solubil solubility is limited, and because of this, it is transported bound to hemoglobin. This means that that oxygen transport system can be saturated. Once all four binding sites on the hemoglobin molecule are bound with oxygen, that's the maximum capacity of that oxygen molecule to hold oxygen. And actually, in a normal physiological condition, as the lung, as the blood passes through the lung, um, it becomes maximally saturated. That's a really important principle. The other thing is that oxygen has limited diffusion capacity because of its low solubility. And therefore, to diffuse across a membrane, Effectively, the membrane has to be thin and there has to be a good gradient across the membrane. Oxygen will diffuse from a gradient of an uh, area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So, for example, when the capillary blood passes across the alveolar membrane, that membrane must be thin enough to allow oxygen to go from the alveoli to the 
capillary and the gradient must be high enough to encourage that movement. We talked about the fact that it's about hemoglobin and the importance of limiting the, the transport in terms of saturation of hemoglobin. When we look at CO2, it's very different. This is a highly soluble gas. The diffusion characteristics are good. So the gas actually is transported, dissolved in the serum. It's produced in the tissues and transported back to the lung for excretion. It has a good diffusion capacity, therefore thickening of the pulmonary membrane, the alveolar capillary membrane, has less effect on the, the excretion of carbon dioxide, the transfer from the blood to the alveoli. Also, although of course there must be a diffusion gradient between the blood and the alveoli, um, there will still be diffusion, even at lower gradients, but there must be a gradient. As we said before, it's transported, dissolved in the serum. So as you can see, oxygen and CO2 are very different gases in the way they behave. And in the next talk, we'll talk about how that affects whether they are excreted or absorbed. Absorbed in the case of oxygen, but excreted in the case of CO2. And also, the kinds of factors that affect the levels in the blood. So that was our first talk. It was really a little summary of gas exchange. And now we're going to build on that in the second talk to explain um, respiratory failure. So this is our first talk on respiratory failure in which we covered the definition and pathophysiology of respiratory failure. In the next talk, we look specifically at type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure. Thanks for listening.